I thank you so much for being here. We are joined today by Dr. Roberto Olivardia. Did I say that right? You did. I did say it. Cool. Awesome. <laughs> he is a clinical psychologist and lecturer in psychology in the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Jesus, that's hard to say fast. <laughs> he maintains a private psychotherapy practice in Lexington, Massachusetts, where he specializes in the treatment of ADHD and obsessive compulsive disorder and body dysmorphic uh, disorder. So I really want everybody to welcome him and, and make him feel appreciated. Go ahead and put in the chat box any questions <laughs> that you may have. Hi, I'm Dr. Oliver Savardia. Can you tell everybody about yourself, what makes you so special, and, and why you do <laughs> what you do? Great. Well, it's great being here and being with all of you, and I'm a big supporter of what this group is, and I think it's really a really important space and platform to have. So I'm Roberto Olivardia. Mentioned I'm a psychologist, um, but I'm also someone with ADHD. I have two children with ADHD and dyslexia, so I come from this topic professionally and personally, for, and as a parent in that perspective. And yeah, basically got into this field because I enjoy working with people and helping people. And, and psychology was the first class in school in my senior year of high school that I liked. And so before that, I told my parents, yeah, I don't think college is going to be for me. I think I'll just be a drummer in a punk band that didn't go over very well <laughs> with my immigrant parents. They sacrifice everything for their kids. And I'm the youngest of three. And then I took a psychology class and I thought, I love this. I'm doing 100% of the homework. Wow, this is great. I'm going to go to college. Oh, why not just get a PhD? And and they were very glad that my high school offered a psychology course. Let's put it that way. So here, here I am and happy to be speaking with all of you about this particular topic because one of the things I work with lots of folks with ADHD, but in particular work with lots of people who have ADHD and a comorbid issue or co-occurring condition of which most people with ADHD have some co-occurring condition. And my specialty is particularly with what happens when ADHD is with depression, OCD, bipolar disorder, addiction. Today, we're going to be talking about everything eating from just everyday eating to eating disorders, obesity. How do we sort of understand the impact that ADHD has, how ADHD is impacted by those things? And so that's, that's what we're talking about tonight. So let me um, share my slides. Now, try to go about 45 minutes and then open it up for questions and discussion. So first is I want you to think about how many decisions you make every day regarding food and eating. And there's actually studies that have looked at this. And now this includes what you eat, how much you're eating, when you're eating, uh, where you're eating, uh, how you eat, how quickly, how slowly are you doing something else while you're eating, What, how much planning you might do about the next day's eating, what decisions you make today that are about tomorrow's eating or the next day's eating. And studies show that we make anywhere from about 180 to 200 decisions based upon food and eating every day. Now, most of these decisions just go kind of subconsciously, like we are even aware of it. And that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today is how to have sort of more of a mindfulness around food and eating. And, and by the way, just to speak to this, that I come from a perspective too of this where I love food and I love that I love food and I love a good meal and I love to eat. And as we know, for lots of us with ADHD, that if we like something, we can run the risk of liking it too much and having it be something that can get dysregulated. But just so you know, my tone of this is to come from a perspective of really being to celebrate food and to enjoy food and to love it. And, and we're not coming from a perspective of looking at food as like good and bad and, and sort of deprivation model around food. We What we're really trying to do is have it be something that people can enjoy and regulate. Now, what do we know about ADHD and eating in general? So there are studies that have looked at how people with ADHD and their relationship with food sort of plays out. In 2012, there was an interesting study, and it was with young people between 10 and 14 who were assessed for mood, for their food choices that they liked, and how hungry they were, 
how impulsive they were. And they divided the groups basically to the group of ADHD kids and the kids that did not have ADHD. And this was in like, basically they had free reign in this food lab to eat anything they wanted. And everything they ate was observed, monitored. They knew exactly the calories that they were taking in. And not surprisingly, that the kids with ADHD ate more. Now, this was not influenced by, this was controlled for body weight, for appetite. And this was not influenced actually by their mood state, their level of hunger, or even their liking of the food. Now, if we think about that for a second. So kids with ADHD ate more of food that they didn't even really like. Now, when they were asked why that was, they said it was it was there. It was just simply there. We find s- similar studies that have looked at people with ADHD who report more disruptive eating habits, tend to eat a less nutritious diet, and tend to have diets that are have significantly higher intake of sugar, especially with beverages. Now, I'll speak to this briefly now that one of the you know, big myths around sugar is that sugar causes ADHD, causes kids to be hyperactive. That's actually not true. Now, certainly if you're having a lot of sugar, it means that you're probably not having a lot of protein and that can have impact on your uh, mood and, and impulse control. But it's really the other way around, as we'll talk about later, that people with ADHD just tend to really love sugar. And so there is a sort of dopaminergic effect when we talk about the brain that we see with ADHD. Now, that's just with just everyday eating. And we'll talk more about other habits that we typically see for folks with ADHD. Now, we also know that people with ADHD have a much higher risk of obesity. And Cortez in 2013 did actually a quite long longitudinal study. It was a long study over 33 years of data following boys who some had ADHD, some did not when they were 10, 12 years old, followed them over 30 years at different points and measuring their body mass index and weight. And each time at each point, following them at 18 years old, at 25 years old, at 30 years old, that the men with ADHD had higher body mass index and a higher rate of obesity at each point that they were followed up for. And a very large study of almost over 11,000 children in Germany found that symptoms that were allied with hyperactivity and ADHD was associated with poorer nutrition, greater, higher energy food intake, and a lot more more TV watching. Now, studies that have looked at individuals who were uh, morbidly obese, who were seeking gastric bypass surgery, which is the weight loss surgery, there was a, a, and I'm hoping that more centers like this are screening for ADHD. I do a lot of talks with some of these centers and talking about the importance of screening for ADHD and understanding that. This 20 years ago, Aldfoss had this idea and looking at patients who presented for bariatric surgery and found that 27% had ADHD. And of the patients whose body mass index was over 40, which is considered in the morbid obesity range, that 43% of them had ADHD. And most of them actually had not been diagnosed prior to the surgery. And what's relevant particularly about that is that those that had ADHD were also uh, less likely to lose as much weight or more likely to put the weight back on after gastric bypass if their ADHD was untreated, which makes sense. Similarly, in an obesity clinic of teens found that almost 60% of them had ADHD, of which only 40% were diagnosed prior to the study. Now, there's a lot more research on those, but I I want to get through the data and talk more about the the strategies and why is this. Now, one of the areas that I specialize in for the last 30 years is working with men and with eating disorders. Um, And I'll talk a little bit more about what we mean by that. I co-wrote a book many years ago called The Adonis Complex. So everything that you heard about, uh, about girls and women with body image, cosmetic surgery, anorexia, bulimia, compulsive exercise, I work with boys and men. Um, And this was something that 30 years ago, there was literally nothing um, written. And so doing this research was filling sort of this gap. And, but there were a lot of men out there that were struggling with these issues. We know that people with ADHD are at higher risk for developing these eating disorders, anywhere from three to six times more likely 
studies have found that even in samples of eating disorder patients, about 30% of them can meet the screening cutoff for ADHD. And in a, met, a large meta-analysis study, that's where you're looking at a whole collection of studies that are all statistically pooled together, find that having ADHD puts someone at a threefold risk of developing an eating disorder. And for people who have eating disorders, if ADHD is present, the symptoms of the eating disorder are more severe. Now that's if, again, keeping in mind that most of these times the ADHD is not treated or is not even identified. Big difference when it's treated, then you don't see sort of the severity of the eating disorder symptoms. And part of the work in the very first ADHD conference 15 over 15 years ago that I spoke at, and I recommend for anyone who hasn't been to the conference that Shane and I were referring to a couple of moments ago, this year, it's going to be in Anaheim, California, in November. I would highly recommend going. It's just, it's a great conference, great sense of community. But the first talk I gave at that was actually in Anaheim, California in 2008 was on ADHD and eating disorders and the importance of really clinically appreciating the role that ADHD can play when it's untreated, you're going to see an exacerbation of all of these symptoms. Now, I want to say a little bit more about that because of my work with men and seeing that this is a, a men's support group, because it's something I feel very passionately about. I work with, again, lots of boys and men who have various eating disorders. And even when I tell people that that's an issue that I specialize in, I mean, certainly years ago, people would be like, what? Like there are boys and men who have eating disorders. Now I get less of that, but I still hear that, which says to me, okay, we still have a lot more work to do in terms of awareness. Studies actually show though, that one of four people who have an eating disorder are male. Now, the thing is, is 20, 30 years ago, there was very little data that no one was researching men with eating disorders and certainly not looking at men and eating disorders in the community. So it was thought of to be a rarity. Well, if you're not researching something, you're not going to get data on it. And therefore, you know, but we can't come to the conclusion that it doesn't exist. We just have to be better at tapping into research studies. So 25% of people who have eating disorders are male. However, only 0.05% of patients in eating disorder facilities are male. That means there are a lot of men with eating disorders who are not getting treatment and who are severely undertreated. About 10 to 15 million men in this country are affected by eating disorders. And a lot of them won't fit the neat kind of criteria that I'll talk about in a moment. They fall under what we call a subclinical range. So that's part of the problem is that they don't check off all the boxes of anorexia, bulimia. And so either the man themselves or their physician or other people might not recognize it in the same way. However, that term subclinical is a bit of a misnomer. Subclinical does not mean less serious. In fact, subclinical eating disorders have just as high of a mortality rate as the clinical diagnostic criteria cut off. It just means that it's just not checking off the same boxes. And in fact, studies have shown that men tend to fall in that NOS stands for not otherwise specified, which is the category that was in the DSM, the Psychiatric Manual of Mental Disorders. So what are the eating disorders? The one that's most commonly associated with ADHD is binge eating disorder. And this is basically characterized by having binge eating episodes. And what that means is you're eating uh, a, a lot of food in a discrete period of time, which is an amount of food that is definitely larger than most people would have in a similar period of time under similar circumstances, and where people feel a lack of control over eating. So it's not just someone who has a hearty appetite. Someone feels like they literally can't stop eating or they can't control how much they're eating. And when they're having these episodes, they're eating very fast in a way that's often more than normal for them, eating until they're uncomfortably full. They're eating large amounts of food, even when they're not even physically hungry. I mean, sometimes it's not even triggered by hunger. They often have these episodes alone because there's a lot of shame and embarrassment around them. Afterwards, often feel very disgusted and depressed and guilty. So there's a lot of distress around it. Now, the criteria will say the binge eating occurs on average at least once a week for three months. Then this is where the subclinical range comes in. I work with men where it might not be once, a week, it might be once every other week, not once a week. That still can produce a problem. If you're having a 
a thousand calorie binge once every other week, that's still, that's problematic. So we have to look at these diagnoses as guides, certainly for these kind of behaviors, but not like if you don't need all of these hundred percent, then you don't have a problem. Now, bulimia nervosa is the second most common that we would see with ADHD, and that's episodes of binge eating. However, it's then people who also engage in compensatory behaviors to undo that binge. Now, they think they're undoing that binge and really either to prevent weight gain. So that's either self-induced vomiting, using laxatives or diuretics, fasting or excessive exercise, and that Again, the criteria would say at least once a week for three months, bulimia is just as dangerous if someone is doing it once a month, that it's very, especially self-induced vomiting is very dangerous for your heart and, and your health in general. Oftentimes there's um, a body image issue um, in that. But when I said before, it doesn't actually undo it, is that the studies show that the more that somebody engages in bulimic behavior, when they purge, the less likely they're actually purging calories. Like our bodies are really designed to survive. And so if you're vomiting all the time, your body's going to vomit water. It's going to vomit, actually purge out the vitamins and nutrients from your food before it will. The fat is the last thing to go, basically. Because at the end of the day, if we were in a famine, you would live longer eating a Big Mac than you would a kale salad. So it it's fine with letting those vitamins and nutrients go and hold on to that fat. So interestingly, a lot of people with both men with bulimia that I work with are not underweight. Most of them are actually overweight. Now there's anorexia nervosa, which is less common with ADHD. A lot of times you'll see OCD with anorexia, but it's not um, it, it's not impossible. I've worked with a you know, number of men with ADHD and anorexia, and that's basically someone who's starving themselves. They're severely restricting um, their caloric and energy intake, um, what is you know, minimally expected for their age, their sex, their developmental uh, trajectory, their physical health. There's often an intense fear of gaining weight or becoming fat, um, although not everyone with anorexia is that in the mix. Sometimes it can sort of fall under these sort of other categories, um, but you'll often see that sort of body image piece. Now, why I said it can fall into these other categories is this diagnosis of ARFID or avoidant restricted food intake disorder, which I was very glad that they put in the DSM because, and there were individuals, and this could be, I see people with ADHD, people with the autism spectrum, who were not eating and they're not maybe taking in the calories that they needed to, but not because they were fearing gaining weight or being fat. In fact, body image was not even part of the issue. It could be more of a texture issue. It could be more of an OCD related issue. Um, but it, this category was basically designed where someone isn't getting the nutrients that they need, but it wasn't sort of assuming why. Whereas anorexia has an assumption of negative body image as the, the mechanism as to why somebody is not eating. So why is this? Like, why do we see people with ADHD at, at higher risk for impulsive eating, for obesity, for eating disorders? When we understand the ADHD brain, it actually, and I always hope when I give these talks and with patients that I work with, for people to feel a sense of validation that because often with food, we look at food, we look at culturally, we look at food, we look at people in larger bodies as this issue of like willpower. And we want to totally get rid of that language. The fact of the matter is that not everybody gets the same reward by the same thing. So it's very easy if somebody, let's say, eats a meal and they're like, their brain is like satisfied with it to say, no, I'm not going to have that second portion. I don't need that second cannoli. I don't have that. My brain is wired in a very different way. I could eat four cannolis very easily. And, 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 and my brain is like really rewarded by that. So it's not an issue of willpower as much as, well, my brain is highly rewarding itself with something in a way that maybe person next to me's brain isn't. Um, now, that's not an excuse. There's a responsibility of then what we take with this data, but it starts with understanding the science. 
An ADHD brain basically has a dopamine deficiency or a dysregulation of dopamine. There's something going on and dopamine is that neurochemical implicated in reward and implicated in motivation. So when we feel really great about something, our dopamine levels are, are rising. I'm a big music person. When I'm at a concert, my brain is flooded you know, with dopamine. When I eat a great meal, now what we know, dope, the things that are very dopaminergic for our bodies to survive, sex is a dopamine releaser, food and food is. Why is that? Of course, we should be highly rewarded by food because if we weren't, our ancestors may not have survived and we wouldn't even be here right now. But we know the ADHD brain has lower levels of dopamine. So they're by nature, our brains are sort of like bored and understimulated. And lower levels of GABA, which is another neurochemical, which means that our brains are less inhibited. So where other people might say, I'm satisfied right now, I'm not going to eat that other thing. Person with ADHD has a harder time doing that. I mean, we're neurochemically sort of wired in that way. Cognitively, people with ADHD have a lower interoceptive awareness. And what that term means is having basically a mindfulness of what's going on in the body. Now, that includes our hunger cues, our satiety cues. It includes our sleep cues, our bowel movement cues, and our emotional regulation cues. These are all things that we have to turn kind of inward to. And people with ADHD have a very hard time. We're sort of more external. So we're more externally oriented and stimulated um, in ways that make it hard sometimes to even know, am I hungry? Like I had to learn the difference between being satisfied and being full. To me, they were one in the same kind of concept of, you know, how, how, you know, how do you even distinguish, you know, between uh, the two? So we can be poor at self-monitoring, even how much we and people with ADHD tend to underestimate how many calories they take in and tend to overestimate how many calories they burn. We also know executive functioning issues, especially for adults, can make it hard to eat healthily. To eat healthily requires a certain level of executive function. You have to manage time. You have to think maybe at 9 a.m. what dinner is going to be at 5 p.m. because you might have to plan for it. You might have to thaw that beef rib, you know, before putting it, you know, in, in, in the oven, you have to organize meal plan. If you have multiple things on the stove, there's a lot of switch, you know, task switching that requires a certain level of executive functioning. We know behaviorally people with ADHD were more impulsive. We have poor sleep habits. Now sleep deprivation actually is a contributing factor to obesity. We are a sleep deprived culture. I could do a whole other talk and maybe at some point I will on, on sleep. But interestingly, again, our evolutionary bodies are designed to survive. And so when we are not sleeping, our bodies actually, for our protection, drop our metabolism. So now we're conserving fat and simultaneously increase a hormone that has us crave fat, simple carbs, and sugar to the point where our senses might even be heightened towards those foods. And our reward system is designed to be more heightened once we get that food. So if you aren't, if you're sleeping four hours the night, your metabolism is dropping and that your choices of what you eat that day are going to be influenced by that. People with ADHD exercise less. We, I, I used to say when I was in college, I used this term procrastinating, that anytime I was procrastinating on something I was supposed to do, i just like eat. I'd like be like, well, you know what? Let me order some chicken wings, you know, from this place. And it would take me an hour to go through the menu. And it was basically just a form of procrastination. People with ADHD also may skip meals. Sometimes you'll often hear, oh, I forgot to eat because I was so hyper-focused on this thing I was doing. Well, that might lead to skip meals, but then guess what happens once that hyper focus is gone and breaks or you're done with the project is people are like, I am so hungry and ravenous. I want to eat my couch. And at that point, you're not craving a healthy chicken salad. You're probably craving, you know, something that's heavy on the fat and heavy on the simple carbs and sugars to replenish that energy. People with ADHD are more likely to eat while doing other things, um, watching TV, looking at their phone driving, which is so unsafe, but I've had patients who are like, yeah, I eat you know, my breakfast while I'm driving um, to work. And when we are not focused and mindful on what we're eating, 
we tend to take in a lot more. Now, we all can relate to the stressful day and maybe eating some Ben and Jerry's ice cream. We had a stressful day. And that happens certainly for people with ADHD where anger and sadness and stress relief, depression, anxiety all become triggers for overeating. But interestingly, the thing I hear most from my patients is boredom, that eating becomes a sort of form of self-stimulation. And that's why the nighttime tends to be the hardest time the most challenging time for a lot of folks with ADHD because they're just almost foraging or feel bored. We know that a lot of in- people with ADHD have self-esteem issues and sometimes the overeating is a, is a way of soothing that. And I've had patients who say that they overeat almost feeling like they're punishing themselves. And so it becomes sort of this extension of low self-esteem. Food is very sensory. So eating has a sense of soothing us and being very grounding. When we're engaging with our senses, we're more grounded. And people with ADHD at baseline don't feel grounded. I I think of ADHD as like, we're kind of, I always feel like I'm always like levitating in some way. And so I'm, what is that thing that's going to ground me down um, in that way? We can be impatient. So it can be harder sometimes to wait for the healthier meal to cook and it's easier to get fast food. And then there's negative body image that people with ADHD can struggle with, which then could play itself out in their eating habits. So briefly, just when we talk about body image, what we're talking about is not our appearance. Our appearance is our objective data of I am five feet 11. So, and there's no denying that. I have brown eyes. There's no denying that. Our body image is different. There's a perceptual aspect, like the picture we have of ourselves in our head, which could be very different than what we actually look like. The affect, how we feel about our body and our body parts and our body shape, how we think about our body in different ways and how we think other people think about our bodies and then how all that influences our behavior. So does that guide us towards exercise, towards making healthier eating choices? Does it guide us towards unhealthy things like taking anabolic steroids or engaging in bulimic behavior? So body image, there that's why we see this disparity is because everybody's body image is very individual and shaped by a whole number of different factors of our upbringing, our culture, our gender. I mean, so many different factors, but it's a myth that men don't have body image issues that we know and that men definitely do, but often don't talk about it. Where there are signs that we, because every, I mean, no, I, I haven't met a person who's a hundred percent satisfied with their body yet, but so all of us can relate to having insecurities, particularly during adolescence, but where it really becomes a problem is where you see distortions in appearance, you know, someone who's saying I'm so fat and then they're not, or someone who's like, I'm so ugly and, you know, I, my arms look so scrawny when in fact they might be quite muscular and defined, where there's a lot of that negative self-talk using word, you know, describing oneself as a pig or a monster, disgusting, like those are terms that are very abusive, you know, language towards ourselves, where people's self-esteem is resting on their appearance that, you know, how we look, you know, could make up maybe this much of our, of how we feel about our overall self, but it cannot be a large part. I mean, in fact, for healthy self-esteem, it has to be what we call the crystallized factors, our intelligence, our sense of humor, how we treat people. Those are things that are pretty steady throughout our whole lives. I can guarantee that your appearance is going to change throughout your life. And so if if someone's self-esteem is on how their appearance is and their body is, it's it means that that self-esteem is going to be very fragile because the body is going to change. And then Certainly anything that someone is doing that's interfering in their lives and engaging in any unhealthy behaviors, excessive dieting, purging, diet pills, starving themselves, steroid use. So one of the things that, and I'm glad to be talking to all of you with this group in particular, is the work that I do with men is a lot of the work is even just orienting men to how they even relate to their bodies. And thinking to, we live in a culture where men are really socialized in lots of ways to disconnect from their bodies. And some of that makes sense. Like if you have men, you know, in our history, historically, men are the ones in the military, like you almost kind of can't connect to your pain if you're in battle. You know, men who are athletes, it's like, hey, you get hit, 
you got to keep, you know, going, you can't, you know, you got to keep your eye on the prize and that sort of thing. So it had almost a somewhat of a functional aspect to it of for strength or being protective or athletics, but it also leads in some ways to never really having this sense of self-care around the body and going overboard where it's like, Hey, pain, like to almost ignore pain and to even acknowledge pain of the body or injury of the body was seen as like weak and not masculine. And even the idea of being health conscious, although this has changed over the years, but being like seen as very health conscious is generally perceived as being less manly and less masculine. Like it's almost seen as like more manly to like, just not care at all about, you know, whatever I'm going to eat what I want and I'm going to do whatever dangerous thing, you know, that, that I want now that, the, the difference, though, is when you have men who are also building their bodies more than we've ever seen, like at the gym and, and that kind of culture. But it's interesting that it's still within that masculine paradigm because they're building a body that's muscular, which is, again, very kind of stereotypical expression of, of being a man. Men are less versed in even understanding their own body image. I've worked with lots of boys and men over the years who don't even sometimes know how they feel about their bodies. And it's getting expressed sometimes in their eating disorder or in the way that they eat, that they don't really think about it. And sometimes will downplay real harm that they might be doing to their bodies. We know that men are less likely to get annual physical exams and dental checkups in a year. So they don't even have that interface as often as women do with their doctors around monitoring their health. And so when we talk about eating, there's also, you know, it's kind of eating and eating a lot is very socially sanctioned with men. Um, and, and in ways that, you know, for women, it's unfair for women because women are socially sanctioned, sanction, it's socially sanctioned in the sense to not have an appetite if you're a woman, which is very problematic. And for men, it's almost like, oh, you eat and that's like a hearty appetite. So a lot of times when men who do have a problem with eating, impulsively or have an eating disorder might not even identify it as a problem because no one around them is saying, this is like an issue here. They just see it as, hey, you're, you know, you're a hearty eater. So what do we do with this? How do we develop these kind of, of strategies for mindful eating? And, and that's really the term we're using is to just be more mindful of it because we want to start with a self-compassionate, non-shaming approach that I don't want anyone to think, oh my gosh, I'm gluttonous or I have no control. And, and that way, we if you have ADHD and this is something you just want to say, look, this is just how my brain is wired. And I just have to look at this as data. And that's necessary in order to then engage with strategies to, to work at this. Because the goal is to enjoy food, to not let it be something that's going against your value of health. And at the same time, we don't want to compromise your love of food in the process. So I often give people an exercise to pay attention to how different foods make you feel in the moment, maybe an hour later and the next day. Now, there's some meals that the next day you're like, I don't know, that meal, uh, it doesn't even carry over. Other meals, like I can tell you, I'm born and raised in Boston and we have a you know, thing called the fisherman's platter, which some of you might know is like fish and chips, like fried haddock, fried shrimp, fried calamari, fried scallops with French fries and onion rings. It's a big vat of oil, basically. <laughs> but it's it, I used to be good. Like I ate so many of those fishermen platters. And the last time I ate one is the last time I'm going to eat one because I realized like a day later after I ate one, I'm like, oh my God, I feel like so awful. I just don't feel like very good. And it occurred to me, oh, it's because I ate that and it's just so much fried stuff. It just didn't feel good. But it's not that didn't come the first time I ate the fisherman's platter, that connection. It took some time to almost be mindful to it. Now, on the flip side, there are some meals like I, for me personally, I love eggs. Eggs to me are like a superfood. When I eat eggs, I feel so fortified. Like it's very... I, it's very visceral to me, the feeling of how nutritious that is for me, other foods like that. So 
I want people to sort of think about that. Like what foods kind of really fortify you? Which ones afterwards do you actually feel like fatigue and like, blah, and like not as good as you thought, you know, you would feel even taking a deep breath before a meal, people with ADHD tend to eat faster, you know, really like shovel the food and sometimes like, like even approaching the dinner table, the lunch table with like, let me just take a deep breath. Let me put my utensil down while I'm chewing my food, swallow it and then pick it up, you know, again. And I do these exercises with patients in my office and it feels so foreign to them. And I get it because I naturally am a very fast eater and had to learn to sort of slow myself down. Try to eat as if you were trying to describe every aspect of the meal to someone who's never had it before. Like if you've never had ravioli and I'm eating ravioli, I'm going to try to describe the texture, the taste of it, how it feels in my mouth, how it smells as I'm eating it. That's a, an exercise in mindfulness. If there are things that you're looking to substitute, you know, to try to find easy replacements for, I don't drink any soda. And I'm not saying everyone has to do that. I mean, for me, I found flavored seltzer water did the trick. And I also found that when I drank soda, it didn't make me feel good afterwards. So that was a good substitute. Now, if you really love soda, then have soda, but then you might want to regulate it because there's a lot of sugar, you know, in, in soda. Also with eating is with ADHD, we tend to be very all or nothing and we don't want to, you know, you can't change everything in one day. I say, just start with one or two things. And there is a large amount of power in just making one small change. I remember when I was a kid, I was sitting at Pat the barber, who was the local barber in the town I grew up in. And while I was waiting for him getting a haircut, I was I was reading a Reader's Digest article. I, I was young at the time. And I remember they had an article where it featured six people who did one thing for the year to, to lose weight. They were all interested in, in losing weight. And one woman had given up soda. One person slept at least seven hours a night. One person, uh, I think, took a 30-minute walk like every day. I mean, there were all these little, just one thing. And then they followed them for the year and said, oh, this is how much weight they lost. And I remember, I don't remember the exact, I remember the woman who gave up soda lost the most amount of weight. But all of them, it was like a substantial weight loss for just one thing that they did. So always just, you know, the power of just one pivot. But watch while you're you know, what you're eating, even while cooking and preparing. A lot of times we sort of nibble and bite without realizing those are extra calories we're taking in. There's a great book called Mindless Eating. And in that book, they talk about this research that using smaller plates and bowls while eating has us be more mindful. Now, it doesn't mean this is all I'm going to eat. If you want a second portion, you get up and you fill that bowl with the second portion, but you're going to be more mindful though of how much you're eating. And that's really the first step. Like of any, I don't work with patients on losing weight, you know, for the patients who, who want to engage in healthy weight loss. I, I, that's not my work. My work is I want to build mindful eating strategies, healthy eating strategies. And with that, if somebody is overweight, that they're, that weight will naturally, you know, um, come off because they're engaging in more mindful behavior. If you're eating out, ask for half of the meal to go. If you're at a restaurant with really large portions, seat yourself accordingly. Holidays, I have my back to the, to the food. I get my food, my plate, and I have my back to it. Now, again, I know the food is there. And at the same time, we're sort of like ADHD people are on a seafood diet. Like if we see it, we eat it. So sometimes out of my, out of sight is a little bit out of mind. There is something called sensory specific satiety, which is what uh, basically if you are craving something crunchy that you don't need to eat sometimes like 10 crunchy things, but which is why buffets can be really tough because it can have a whole different palette of different sensory, something that's smooth, something that's crunchy. Those situations we want to be very careful uh, for. So in portion sizes, you know, we have measuring cups, but if you don't have a measuring cup to know that like your fist is about a cup. If you think about like a cup of rice or vegetables, your cupped hand is about a half a cup. Your palm is about three ounces. Your thumb is about a tablespoon and your thumb tip is about a teaspoon. Uh, Cause I work with, again, patients who are like, yeah, I don't have measuring cups. I lost them. I don't know where they went. Like just, you know, we talk to the hand behavioral strategies. 
having a structure, particularly at nighttime, I have people identify what's the, the trigger time for you of maybe impulsive eating or overeating. And let's have a proactive plan of what other things you could do. What are other, and they have to be things that are stimulating too, because it's not enough to say, oh, just, you know, I don't know, read. If you're not a reader, that's not going to work. It has to be something that's stimulating, but grounding at the same time, because at nighttime, it's not like you want to overactivate your senses. So then it makes it hard to go to sleep. Time management strategies, a lot of times with, again, meal planning, it's just managing time and saying, okay, I'm going to eat at this time, which means at this time I'm going to gather my ingredients. Or if someone is at work, making sure that they're not skipping that meal and they're hyper-focused, just eat that sandwich or that protein bar even just to get something in you so you're not setting yourself up for a later binge. Sleep hygiene arranging the food in your house where all the snack foods go in one place and preferably in a cabinet that's shut. Now, you know it's there, but studies will show you're less likely to reach for it versus if it's right on a counter that it's just so much easier to eat. And the flip side is also true. Uh, studies show if people put fruit, like I love mandarin oranges. If I have a bowl of mandarin oranges, it's just right on my counter. I'm more likely to just grab it, peel it, you know, and eat it. If I have a bag of Doritos, I'm going to be grabbing you know, the Doritos. Sometimes I have people, you know, if they are sometimes confused as to like, how did I, you know, gain weight or I don't understand like how this is, I'm, I'm not um, getting fit. I've been working out all the time. Sometimes it's that people are not good estimators of how much they're eating. And so as an exercise, I've had clients like just take a picture of everything that they eat, everything like their meals there. And sometimes, and then when we meet, I, you know, ask them about their week and they'll, you know, recall some of the stuff. And then we go through the pictures and sometimes they're like, oh, I forgot about that. Oh, I forgot I ate that. Oh, I forgot even before sitting down to eat, I had nibbled it and eaten basically, you know, a bunch of ravioli even before I like sat down to eat. And again, it's not to shame oneself. If it's a lot of food, it's a lot of food. It's more, again, just to get accurate data. When you go to the supermarket, have a list, not only of the food that you want, but of some goals, even just one or two goals. Like I want to eat healthy, or I, you know, I, I want to train for this 5k race. Never go to the supermarket hungry. Never, ever go to the supermarket hungry because I guarantee you, you're going to make choices of food that are going to be less healthy. Studies show that if you pop a mint or freshen your breath, swish with some Listerine before going to the supermarket, you're less likely to be buying foods that are like higher in fats and sugars. You're, you don't crave foods the same way. In the same way that like after we brush our teeth, we generally don't want to be eating something because our breath is fresh. So that's a good technique when you're in the supermarket, you know, chew some mint gum um, the whole time. And that study show will alter your choices. And also be honest with yourself. You know, a big part of it too is like, I love Oreo cookies. I'm convinced there's cracks like in the cream of an Oreo cookie. I could like bathe in that stuff. I mean, and I know if I bring a package of Oreo cookies in my house, they're not going to last long. The packaging is so easy. You just peel it. I can eat a couple and then go away. And then I come back and eat a couple more. And it the whole, and then I'm like, whoa, how did the package, you know, get be done so quickly? So I have to be honest with myself of not bringing a package of Oreos. Now, that doesn't mean I don't eat Oreos. I might buy a package of six and eat that. And that's fine, you know, but I don't want by the end of a day to eat 30 Oreo cookies. That doesn't mean that's not. You know, aligned with my health values. Get healthy staples like peanut butter or almonds or fruit or yogurt, things that are nourishing that you like. And again, it has to be sustainable because again, the whole idea of like diet culture is to eat foods that people might not even like. Like I'm not a big fan of rice cakes. If you like rice cakes, power to you. I think they're disgusting. I feel like I'm eating styrofoam. So that is not going to be a snack I'm going to eat. It has to be something that's going, a snack that I like. Like, for example, I don't like typical pretzels. I don't like the, I don't know, the way they're shaped. However, I do like pretzel rods. And there's a specific brand of pretzel rods that I just like 
crunching them and and in that form, but pretzel shaped form. And that's the thing with ADHD. We can be very specific and nuanced even about that, those kinds of textures or, or taste. If you have kids, buy snacks uh, for your kids that you don't like, if you can. I mean, if they're obviously snacks that they like, but you know, Halloween time, I am not a coconut fan. So I buy Almond Joy candy for trick-or-treaters. They love them and I'm not going to dip into it. If you can buy single package portion controlled with cravings, sometimes we might need an element of what we're craving. If we want a little something crunchy, maybe we need a little something crunchy. A banana or yogurt isn't going to cut it. But again, finding certain substitutes for that. But also asking ourselves, are we craving something? Are we hungry or are we just bored? Sometimes if people know I'm just bored and I'm just looking to eat, going back to the brushing teeth, chewing gum, sometimes even the oral stimulation of gum is enough where it's almost like a fidget for our mouth, punting the craving, saying, you know what, maybe I'll have that thing, but let me just wait 15 minutes. And in that 15 minutes, you kind of engage yourself with something. And sometimes maybe you'll have that thing after the 15 minutes, but a lot of times you might not, it might go away the craving. Distracting yourself, having a healthy sensory substitute. Sometimes we're thirsty, when we think we're hungry, we're really thirsty. Sometimes people will work for a craving where they'll almost couple maybe something that they've been procrastinating on with their ADHD and say, you know what, I'm going to enjoy that piece of cake, but let me at least get this form that I have to fill out for my doctors first. And then, and that way they're coupling that. And that could be you know, almost like a productive use. Now, that's not to say you always have to earn your dessert, you know, or earn a, a treat. This would, again, be more for things that maybe somebody has to do anyway and are just kind of coupling. And again, engage in the craving, but in a regulated manner and enjoy. And I'm going to go through these last slides briefly because I want to open it up for discussion and questions. But with nutritional approaches, Often it's just realistic expectations and having a common sense approach. I have people just read labels, even in food. Most of us don't. And if you don't recognize a lot of the terms, it probably means it's less good for you. You know, if it has a lot of chemicals, there's a lot of processed food that we eat as in, in our culture, they're generally not as good. Now with dietary information, it's also, we get mixed messages. I mean, I grew up at a time, you know, where margarine was seen as the the best thing, you know, not butter. Now we know margarine is terrible, like for you, that eating butter is better, but just don't eat a stick of butter uh, with it. We know that, you know, all of these, a lot of these artificial sweeteners are not really good for our body, that pure sugar is better than some of these artificial sweeteners for the most part. Now, I'm not saying that for everybody, for people who are diabetic, obviously there's a, a big difference, but but to have less of you know, the sugar. So the more natural ingredients, the better. For restaurants that you eat out at, go on their website if they have nutritional information. Honestly, you'll probably be shocked. There's a reason restaurant food <laughs> tastes really good because they load it uh, with stuff. I remember um, now Cheesecake Factory does not publish their nutritional information, but I think a disgruntled employer had released some of their nutritional information online. And I found out one of the sandwiches that I used to eat um, has 77 grams of fat in it, which is like astronomical. I knew it was like fattening, but I would not have thought that. It really is hard, I think, it's, and I think particularly for people with ADD to wrap their head around like, and I have to, I visually do this sometimes with clients, like even with like sugar, like with 56 grams of sugar, which is typically in a Mountain Dew, what 56 grams of sugar looks like, it's hard to imagine all that sugar in like something that's this big, that it's that concentrated. And if you are struggling with eating, with weight, certainly with, you know, any eating issues, consult a doctor, consult a nutrition, a nutritionist. And when it comes to your body image, you know, think about like, what do you love about your body? What do you like? What do you feel neutral about? What do you dislike? What do you really dislike? We all kind of have that sort of curve, but be aware of what your body image self-talk is. Are you saying, oh, I look this way? Or are you saying, hey, you know what? I look good in this outfit today. Black is a good color on me. I like this hat that I'm wearing. What is your relationship to food? How do you what is your language around that? What else is going on that you find yourself maybe obsessing 
on appearance for people who might find their body image to be really getting in the way of their lives to understand that that often is a symptom for something else. What gives you self-esteem? How much weight do those things hold versus you know your body image? And knowing that for people who struggle with body image issues, that it never is just about their body image. It's this idea that having a quote unquote perfect appearance, which of course we know there's no such thing, is is almost sold culturally to us. If we have a certain kind of body, that all these great things are going to come to us. And we know that that's not true. I mean, I've worked with men who have been on the cover of fashion magazines who any of us would objectively say are good looking individuals and they don't see themselves that way because they're comparing themselves maybe to somebody else. And and they thought, well, if I had the certain body that I thought I would be confident and I wouldn't have social anxiety anymore. And that doesn't happen. We still have to work on those things. So we want to stop that sort of what I call mental cosmetic surgery, like imagining our body to be something in a way that is hurting us, which is very different than somebody who's working towards, again, healthy weight loss or healthy to see that they can get to their goal, but understanding that, you know, there's work, you know, to be done in that stop negative self-talk to ourselves and with others unhealthy behaviors, comparing ourselves to other people in a way that devalues us, any harmful body checking. You know, I work with individuals who might mirror check or take selfies or touch parts of their body that they feel are to this or to that, and any negative mirror talk. And we want to adopt a health-oriented approach uh, versus it being about like, I have to lose weight. It's I have to be healthy and understanding that health it looks different for different people. There are some people in larger bodies who are more healthy than people who are in smaller bodies. So we also have to honor the body that we have and, and our genetics in that. We want to consume media in a mindful way, surround ourselves with affirming people, supporting other people, and challenging any of those cognitive distortions that we might have around, oh, if I violate this dietary rule, then it's all over and I might as well eat everything. No, it doesn't have to be that way. Practicing self-compassion and of course, seeking professional help if body image, if eating disorders, if these things really are problems for you. So I went a little over 45 minutes, but I we have about a half an hour for questions, discussion. Be curious what y'all think. I really appreciate this, by the way, man. I don't know. Obviously, I don't think you were able to attract a chat, but we were having a pretty lively discussion over there. One of the things that you brought up in that last, those last couple of slides was the the body image, right? Yeah. That was one of the things I struggled with the most for yeah. a long time growing up. And it wasn't until I went to a therapist and I was talking to them because my wife was going through to get bariatric surgery and they encouraged us both to go to therapy. And I said, like, one of the biggest issues is I sit here and I see these bodybuilding uh, competitions and stuff like that. And I'm thinking that that's what I'm supposed to look like. And so when I go to the gym, I get really discouraged because I, you know, there's no way for me to do that. Like, right. I, and I, cause I see the guys in there, but then the therapist flipped it on me. She goes, and she pulled up two pictures and she goes, okay, which of these do you really think would you would look like? And she had one of a bodybuilder and then one of a power lifter the power lifter. Yep. And I was like, I mean, well, and it, it, it was like a light bulb went off like, oh, I would actually, if I mean, at my best weight, this is what I look like. Mm -hmm. And she's like, so stop going for this. This is unrealistic expectations. This is what you'll look like. And that's the thing. There's nothing wrong with this if right. you're built like this because of you're eating the calories that you need to eat. You're building the muscle mass. You're working out. You're exercising, but in healthy ways. That's if that's if that's what you wind up looking like, that's okay. Right. It, that it was weird because that was like the one trigger I needed. And that really helped me with my body image. The other thing is, is she was like, make sure you go to the doctor and get your blood panels done on a regular basis so that you can see that your stuff is, is good there. So, like, you exactly. know, my cholesterol has actually never been an issue for me, even though I am obese. You know, mm -hmm. my, my blood work is often really good, you know, and I, I still have to deal with the other issues that come with obesity, like, you know, fatty liver disease is an issue that I'm actually looking at right now. I may have, mm -hmm. 
and there was those issues, but overall, generally speaking, my blood pressure is good. My cholesterol is good. I need to pay attention to that stuff too. So just understanding right. my body and getting those regular Absolutely. check-ins. So I wanted to kind of touch and Joey, I see your hand is raised, but I want to touch on something. Somebody asked very early on Evan in the chat said in the slide, just before the binge eating slide, you had said, how do you define what most people would normally do? Mm. And I, I think there was just some clarification needed for that one part. Yeah, it's a good question. And we, there isn't this sort of set guidelines of, and that's where, you know, the diagnostic criteria of like, yeah, what what do we consider sort of normal? So a lot of times, you know, we would look at somebody of a, a certain body weight, um, of a certain age and say, okay, generally like this is how many calories like we would expect that this person would have or they would feel like a sense of satiation of satiety versus like, you know, I know when I was an adolescent, if you're about to go through a growth spurt, like you can eat a lot more food, you know, like I, I was like, I could eat a house, you know, when I was at, at that age. And, and so you take those factors into consideration, but it isn't, a set rigid rule of like this many calories, but you kind of take into account kind of all of those factors and with all of those other symptoms. But yeah, it, there isn't like a set, like this is like a normal, I think it's kind of, you know, it's almost one of those things a lot of times, certainly with the patients that I work with that you kind of know it when you see it, like they often know it, you know, when they see it, know that this is more than just, I'm, eating a lot like when they're engaging in binge eating behavior yeah um another question that came up both in our facebook group and on here or loosely related to here what diets are best for adhd or for people with adhd is keto good because we see that a lot in the group mm. intermittent fasting is that good like are there any specific diets that are good or better for people with ADHD? Mm. So that's a good question. So one is that I would never promote a certain diet and the, from the perspective of that, it never is that like a blanket statement because what would work for me might not work for you. And because we're all individuals with different individual bodies, um, with any of these kinds of things, we have to take into consideration. And this is why like even the term dieting, we know that really doesn't work because it has to really be like a lifestyle change, like something that's going to be sustainable, something that um, you can afford. I mean, some of these diets are like crazy, like expensive, like it, you know, there's almost like privilege, you know, to be able to engage in, in some of it and talking to your doctor about it. Now I have a colleague at uh, McLean hospital, which is a psychiatric hospital here in Boston, who he does a lot of really interesting research on the keto diet with people with psychotic disorders, with schizophrenia, and has found these really interesting data of improvement of symptoms that, you know, you would see with that. Now with ADHD, there hasn't really been any research that has looked at like a specific thing. And I think part of that is it's so varied, like even like how all of our ADHD manifests could be very, very different. Now I can tell you like with something like intermittent fasting in the, in, in the eating disorder community, you know, which I'm connected to in my work with men, they, um, I would say overall, it's very, very looked down upon as something that is almost like an invitation to an eating disorder. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think that there are can be health benefits to it. One of the methods of intermittent fasting is like if you eat all of your calories between 11 a.m. and 7 p.m. I've tried that at times and it's worked actually really well um, for me. Now, I wouldn't say that I do that all the time. Some days it's going to be, and some times of the year that's more sustainable than at other times. So the, the bottom line, I guess, for that is you know, talk to your doctor. And I think what, what the example you shared, Shane, about which I, my son's a power lifter actually. And, and, you know, it works really well with his frame and he's muscular and it, and it requires you to eat um, and eat healthily in that way. Whereas bodybuilding is really generally about more like restriction and about the aesthetics, which is very different, but talking to your doctor about what diet is going to work well, with my kind of body, 
And with whatever else might be going on medically, because some of these diets could unintentionally create other problems like for, for people. And then what do I know of myself and the way that my ADHD works that's going to be sustainable um, for me? So it's not, it's not maybe an answer that someone was looking for, but it's kind of looking at it holistically. Yeah, I mean, and that makes a lot of sense because, you know, when, when you start factoring in texture issues, right, texture mm -hmm. issues and taste issues alone kind of eliminate some diets. And then, of course, there's diets like the no carb diet where right. you're literally, why am I so tired? Well, you don't have <laughs> literally you have no fuel in your body. That's, right. that's what's going on now. So, right. all right, Joey, you had your hand uh, raised and I really appreciate your patience. What do you got, boss? So I have the binge eating disorder and 11 days ago, I just decided I'd had enough. I downloaded a sobriety app. I downloaded the food tracking app and I'm now 11 days clean. So something that I'm doing, which I'm, I'm curious about, which I think may be promoting the similar binge eating behavior is that I have a very high protein breakfast. So I have like eggs and bacon and some coffee for breakfast, which is great. Then I skip lunch and then I have a huge dinner, which I track. But it's sort of like controlled binging. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm wondering if if I'm kind of like, you know, the alcoholic with the wine in, in his cabinet. If I'm if I'm if I'm encouraging the same behavior, I should switch to three meals a day and stop that behavior because mm -hmm. I, I've I'm losing weight. I'm down six six pounds in eleven days, but I'm def I, I've been doing this routine where I, I have a nice hearty breakfast. I skip meals throughout the day. I use caffeine to lower my appetite. And mm -hmm. I have new dinner. So I'm curious how you feel about that. If that's something that I should stray away from or what your thoughts are. Yeah. So this is where, you know, it, it, the, the proof is going to be in the data. So I, I, there are some research that shows that some people do better with eating two meals, as long as you're getting your calories and the eating, you know, two good hearty, you know, meals. And sometimes, and it's almost, again, sort of that model, like intermittent fasting, you know, where maybe they're skipping, you know, lunch or not eating lunch. Now, if that dinner becomes something that feels, let's say, out of control, then that means it's not working, you know, or if you're eating, you know, even more calories, sometimes like people find it when they're doing that, they're actually eating much more calories on the net, you know, part. Now you mentioned like you're in, have seen some weight loss. So maybe that's not happening, you know, with you. And now, whereas for other people, it is better for them maybe to have, even if it's like a protein bar, even if it's a yogurt, just a little protein to just curb so that they're not overeating later in the day. But the fact that you talked about the protein, we do find that generally, you know, American breakfasts are like cereal is really not, most cereal is very not nutritious and not substantive. I mean, I could eat a box of cereal and be hungry like a half hour later. So it actually is highly encouraged. I eat eggs, mo you know, most mornings or yogurt. So if you're having a high protein breakfast, that may be sustaining you actually through lunch where, you know, if you're not hungry and if, you know, you're drinking, as long as you're not overdoing the caffeine and, and the coffee, I mean, drinking a couple cups of coffee actually is not bad, like for your body. I mean, coffee and, and caffeine, as long as there's not a ton of sugar and cream in it, it actually has health, you know, benefits. And you're eating dinner and you're enjoying it and you're not feeling like that's going out of control, then that may work. And but just you want to be very mindful of the data that if if it's starting to feel out of control, if you find that even after eating that meal, you're snacking more in the nighttime, that could be your body's way of saying, oh, we're we are we're experiencing that lunch that not eating lunchtime is like a famine. And so we're going to make up, you know, for it. So it really is different. And I think that's also what I want to impress in this conversation is that so often we hear like, this is the way to do it. And this is the way to eat. And this is wrong. Like, and there would be some people that say it's, you should not be eating two meals a day. You should be having three meals a day. And like, but what we know is that it, it really can vary with people. And particularly I've worked with patients with binge eating disorder and first, you know, congratulations and, you know, for, for having, you know, that moment and working on this and, and I wish you the best in, in your recovery. It's very difficult. And I've worked with, I would say a large 
majority, probably the majority of men that I work with with binge eating disorder, and especially those that also have ADHD, which most of I would say my patients with binge eating disorder have ADHD, um, have had a history of substance abuse, of alcoholism or drug addiction. And this is not my words. This is my patient's words, which will say that as difficult as it was to recover from alcohol and drugs, which is like an amazing feat for anyone in, you know, in sobriety, food issues are a whole different animal because you have to eat. Like there is no abstinence model. You can't, you know, all the things that AA teaches us about don't associate with, you know, drug using people, don't go to the bars, you know, don't, you can't do that like with food. So it, you have to be honest with yourself. And I have patients who they're like, if I eat three meals a day, that's almost three opportunities to binge eat. And I'd rather, it's just simpler if I kind of keep it to two, but they work with their doctor and nutritionist to make sure they're getting the the proper calories. Cause we want you to make sure that you're getting, you know, that uh, you're healthy. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, I talked about this in the chat and everything, but you, you know, you had brought up that do one thing, just do one thing and and, mm -hmm. and focus on that. The the one thing that I did was I got my fitness pal, and I mm -hmm. love that. I preach to the choir about fucking my fitness pal all day long, mm -hmm. you know. And their paid plan it's eighty dollars a year. Uh, I'm not, this is not an advertisement for it. It's just I do love it. But like I could take a picture of my plate and it measures out my portions and it puts in the general idea of what I have and I have to a little correction and then like but that's so much easier than me having to type it in mm -hmm. or just like scanning the barcode of of the the cereal I'm eating and then putting in okay I had two servings of that cereal yeah just doing that naturally made me start pulling back because it also does a big breakdown of my body weight, my height, my age, my activity level. All right. You need this many calories a day to maintain. You need this many calories a day to lose weight. Here's how long it can take you to lose weight. And yeah. by seeing those numbers and then seeing how much I'm eating, I naturally start thinking about, okay, I need to get lower than that though. All right, exactly. what do I need to exactly. do? And so now I'm paying attention to what I'm eating more. I'm, I'm paying attention to my my portion control and stuff like that. Yeah. But I don't have to change what I'm eating per se unless I'm really trying to get myself down there. So like sugars and salts. But it shows me all of that. Absolutely. And then and, and I that was just like my one big thing that I did. And that was literally that just fueled the rest of the stuff that I uh, got into. Yeah. And tracking, I mean, even, you know, with, with um, Joe, with you were mentioning before about tracking, I mean, that is, again, it's, just, it's data because again, we don't want to say, oh my gosh, this, this cake has X amount of fat. I'm definitely not going to eat it. No, but it says if now I have the information and now I'm determining, is this worth it to me? Just like if you had $200, you know, and you went into a store and there was, a jacket that you really liked and it was $200, you'd be like, hmm, that's like all my money. Is it worth it? Some Maybe it might be, but you might be like, mm, no, I'd rather, you know, spread those out. Like, you know, and that food can be that same way. Like if there's certain kinds of food that I'm like, no, I'm going to eat this because I, you know, really like I'm, I'm in, in the North End in Boston, which is like the Italian, you know, area and like, I'm going to get a cannoli from Mike's pastries because it is like the best cannoli. <laughs> like I am not going to like, I'm just going to get that, you know, and I'm going to, you know, enjoy it. But if I'm at the supermarket and they have cannolis there, their cannolis aren't as good as there. I don't need to get it. Or like a chocolate chip cookie. Well, I, I can have a chocolate chip cookie anytime. So you start to be aware of that. But yeah, those, there are a lot of great apps like that, that, as long as it's encouraging a mindfulness and you're right, it naturally just has you realize hmm, how much is this worth? And, and just, or just even seeing the number. I mean, sometimes when I look at nutritional labels, I'm like, damn, that has a lot of sodium in it. Like, do I need that much salt? No. Like, and I'll just like try just seeing the number, especially like there was something, there was like a bag of some potato chips or something. And I looked in the supermarket and and one, I mean, I'm not going to have one serving is like a handful. I'm going to probably have three servings. So I triple the amount. 
And that would have been 150% of my sodium intake that I should have in the day with three handfuls of these chips. I mean, way too much. I'm like, yeah, no, I'll pass. Yeah. All right, Chris, you had a question? Yes, thank you. I just throw my hand here. So this is awesome. And it seems like uh, there's a lot of fantasticness coming out of uh, Harvard. Uh, I, I just saw a podcast from, uh, I believe, one of your co colleagues, Dr. Chris Palmer. Yes, he's the, he's the colleague I was talking about, the keto yeah. diet. So, and combining both worlds, like I, I know you need to pay attention and you need to attract the data. He was, and if anybody you know, you want to continue down this journey, you got to see some of his podcasts. He's talking about the metabolism, how important food is for it to, to fuel your brain Absolutely. and the microchondria, the, the transport yep. that take it to your brain. And I was, I'm like, I, I started it going, ah, how does this work? And then I'm like, holy smokes, this makes so much sense. So my question is, obviously, if you supercharge some of your diet with things that are, are cog help with cognitivity, those type of things, like, fish and a heavy B12s and all that kind of stuff. Now I know we always have to run that, you know, go talk to your doctor, those types of things. But is there, to be honest with you, I'm not going to speak for everybody, but yeah. I, I, I won't do it. It's just not chemically in my body to pay attention, to systematically go in, know my sodium counts. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. It's just, I, I barely get my pants on right. So <laughs> what I'm getting at is if I can at least focus on the B vitamins and et cetera, is there at least one thing or two that if you at least focus and get into your diet, you're, you're heading in the right direction and setting yourself up for success. Would you say it's a B12? Hi, Alex. Hello. Am I making sense? In yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I would say, I mean, to me, I would say Protein is probably the number one nutrient that I would I always recommend that people really pay attention to because protein is is very substantive in the body. So, you know, whether it's in the form of eggs or chicken, like, you know, and and that question I posed earlier is like, how do you feel an hour after you eat this or an hour? When mm. people have like more protein, they just notice they're not craving sugar as much, you know, in general. So that would be my number one studies show with people with ADHD and you know, there's not like a large group of studies, but there's enough that show that kids with ADHD and perhaps adults tend to have reduction of essential fatty acids in the brain. And that there's this correlation of sort of lower essential fatty acids with like more hyperactive impulsive symptoms. So the omega-3 fatty acids, you know, they say would, could be a good, whether it's supplementation and again, you know, I'm not a physician, so I always tell people to talk to your doctor, um, like in the case of like a fish oil pill um, or foods that have, you know, have the, uh, that vitamin B12 is another one um, that I would say. There are some studies that have looked at, you know, how um, ADHD bodies or brains don't process zinc and magnesium. And so looking for foods high in that. Um, but my, my number one go-to is with protein that, and the thing is, is that I remember a nutritionist that I heard at a conference and this stuck with me said that, you know, we focus a lot on, you know, of course the like bad food or unhealthy food, junk food. And, but it's a lot of times it's what we're not eating. That's more important. That could be more important than what we're eating. So even if somebody were eating a high sugar diet, the problem with that is not just that it's high sugar, but because they're eating that they're probably not having protein you know, or they're not having other sort of more nutritious foods. If you don't mind, can I add on to something there? Because this is actually something I was talking to a client of mine about. We also need to remember that sunlight is super important for us being outside, being in nature, getting the mm -hmm. vitamin D from the sun. Oh, yeah. And when wintertime hits and we're not outside as much as we normally would be, adding in a vitamin D supplement, or if you're like me and you're a vampire and the sunlight burns, you know, making sure that you have a vitamin D supplement that you're taking or eating mm -hmm. foods rich in vitamin D. Sunlight is best. This is the next best. But making sure that we're also getting that so that we don't deal with that slump. And that's also for a lot of people, we get this question in the group, why is my doctor giving me blood tests whenever, I'm, whenever I say I have ADHD? And that's because they need to see 
how are your zinc levels? How are your vitamin D levels? How are your B12 levels? You know, how, do, mm -hmm. how are these different levels of these things in you? Because raising them up are going to significant, may significantly help you. Um, yep. Well, that that's an excellent point because I apps I am one of those people where I have it in my calendar when we turn those clocks ahead. It's like a holiday for me. I like I have equator genes. Like I need the sun. I love the sun. I love Boston, so I won't move from Boston. But I don't like the winter time. But I absolutely notice when we turn the clocks back and it gets darker earlier. I literally, I, it feels very evolutionary to me, like a bear that is looking for food. My, I have to be on top of that a lot more versus when there's more sunlight, you're right. You're more active. You can do, you know, more things. And that's the case with a lot of my clients who just who notice when it's darker, when it's colder, that they're eating a lot more. And some of it is because you're in the house more, but also there is this evolutionary instinct for us you know our ancestors had to eat a lot of fat and a lot of food because there was going to be a famine you know when it was winter time bears do that all the time <laughs> yeah and i kind of want to take a kind of a sidestep here it, 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 it is a tangent but it is i think it's something that's important you also have to understand right that a lot of the symptoms that we talk about and i'll use working memory for example a lot of the, the the issues that we have with working memory stems from the fact that working memory is a little fragile, even mm. for neurotypical people. Absolutely. But, you know, whenever we sit here and we talk about that, we don't realize how stress affects working memory, how our energy levels, our actual sleep yep. and things like that affects our working memory. And if we're already having a struggle with that because of how our brains are designed, adding in the factor that we feel things more naturally on top of having a lot of stress and frustration and lack of exercise and stuff like that, where you're blowing off that steam, no hobbies. If you're, you know, if you're locking yourself away, you're isolating yourself, you're adding to your symptoms that you're going to be dealing with that are negative about ADHD. Right. And so this is why eating better is so important because you need to have the natural energy levels so that you're you're not just piling more stuff that's stressing out your working memory. Exactly. And so exactly. that's there's there's a lot of different ways that eating better and eating you know more mindfully helps with ADHD symptoms specifically. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Remy, what do you got, boss? So I'm going to find a way to hopefully you know, ask this question um, concisely. And first off, you know, thank you for doing this um, talk. I was a big fan of your work with uh, Justin Baldani for the Man Enough series. So, mm -hmm. uh, oh, I really enjoyed doing that. That was that he was great to work with. It was, you know, I feel it's really an honor to talk to the person that was, you know, part <laughs> of that discussion. Uh, <laughs> But I appreciated that you know, early on in the conversation, you talked a lot about, you know, feeling our bodies and what is comfortable for that. And I guess, how would you recommend that within the context of intimacy without necessarily getting into unhealthy or toxic stereotypes that might be more kind of that might affect men more their you know, exploration of themselves and their exploration of their, you know, physical health and mental health. So if I understand, like, in terms of how body image can in interact with intimacy, yeah, like, just in general, absolutely. I mean, a lot of, you know, the men I work with, I mean, when they have negative body image, that that's, you know, the thing that it really can affect their ability of, of intimacy, having relationships and intimacy and and different levels, you know, with a, a partner, sexual intimacy, physical intimacy, but also just even social intimacy, even being seen, you know, in, in public. And so it it makes it really important of, um, you know, understanding that, you know, the goal of, of intimacy is, is connection. And that a lot of times people who struggle with negative body image are assuming, and this is what we call like those cognitive distortions or assuming how I feel and think about my body is exactly how other people are going to feel and think about my body. And that's not always going to be the case because again, our relationship to our body is 
very personal. We think about it and for people who struggle with body image issues or eating disorders. They're thinking about it all the time. You know, they're they're might be mirror checking and and scrutinizing their appearance. It's almost it's like very unfair comparison. Other people are not relating to us in that way. Now, that's not to say we're always going to be seen as attractive to everybody. Of course not. You know, that people have their own, but it does start when I work with men on this issue is starting with understanding that their relationship to their body is not how other people are relating to it. It may not even be how other people are seeing them. And then focusing on what are the things that you feel good about with your body. Because again, a healthy body image doesn't mean that we always love how we look or 100% love or or love 100% of our body. It's again, like, what are the things that we love that we like that we feel neutral about there are some things that we really dislike about our bodies but looking at that on a spectrum as opposed to the over focus on maybe things that people might not like and assuming that that defines us in in that kind of way and especially you know with intimacy that a lot of times it's assuming that you know with the the partner what they're looking for is the connection um in that way and so understanding that our bodies, all, every body is designed for that. We don't have, we could be in any kind of body and still have that kind of, you know, connection. So I think it's, it's really counteracting a lot of that negative thinking. And then sometimes even for individuals, it could be like what we call like more exposure based therapy. So it may be like zero to a hundred in terms of that comfort level in intimate settings. So I might have people sort of practice where they're kind of in more social settings with maybe, you know, having their shirt off at a beach or something like that, because even being, you know, unclothed around someone else is just too threatening to them and, and triggering a lot of body image issues, finding safer ways of kind of exploring that, or even individually, you know, as I think you mentioned, even as individuals, I mean, I have clients who can't even see themselves naked, you know, even when they're by themselves, um, they have a very hard time even connecting to their body. And that's part of the problem is going to what I was saying before. I mean, men in general kind of have this disconnection from the body and body image, but people who struggle with body image issues almost like disembody themselves by not like they're obsessed about it on one hand, but also don't want to connect to it. And so we need to kind of connect to our Cells and our bodies, but not in a way that's obsessive. So it's, and this is where the ADHD piece comes in is because ADHD people, we have a hard time regulating things. And, but that's even with our body image, you know, we have to regulate that space of how do I connect and observe and understand my body for what it is and not be obsessed about it and not be judging it and be harsh about it in a way that's now actually getting in the way of values that I have, including relationships. Yeah. And I kind of want to add on to this, and this is a life lesson. And it's just the thing that I learned from, you know, in multiple different seminars and stuff like that, that I've gone to, this is a place for us to, if we're with a partner for a, a certain amount of time and they've earned our trust and shown that they are a safe space, this is a good place for us also to be vulnerable. And telling our partners who we, you know, may be struggling with intimacy issues, hey, I, I'm struggling because I have this, I don't, I don't like how I X, Y, Z look. Mm. And getting feedback from them and them giving their honest, you know, again, if they've shown that they're tr trustworthy and safe, giving you feedback, how much of it is in your own head and mm. having somebody else externalize, I think you're really good looking or I, you know, I, there's, you know, I don't feel like there's anything and hearing that can help us start to have better, better, better on body image because they're safe. They're trustworthy. They've proven themselves. Yeah. We are happy with them. Like, this is something I had to do with my wife. I was like, I don't like my body. And she's like, cool. I get it. Mm -hmm. I, I totally understand that. And I need you to understand what I do like about your body. And mm -hmm. there was this, just very frank conversation about that. And it was like, oh. And that was enough for me to start getting past that. And like, there's other people in my life who I've, who I've had that conversation with girlfriends and stuff like that. And again, 
having them tell me that made me feel much more better, much better about myself where I could feel comfortable, you know, being around them and not having so many issues because that communication, there was no anxiety in my brain because we've already broken that ice and had that conversation. Yes. There's no, you know, rat running on the wheel of like, oh, what are they doing? What are they thinking? What are they thinking? You know, it's, I, they've told me and I trust them. So absolutely. That's thing. But, but I think what's so important about that too, is even just for men to even disclose that and say that, you know, it's almost like more socialized and acceptable. You know, if a woman would say, you know, I'm uncomfortable with my body that, and, you know, again, we want women to have that space to say it. But a lot of the patients I work with don't like relationships have ended because they don't, they can't bring themselves to say that because they're like, oh, then I'm going to be seen as weak and all of them. Like, no, that's, that's the very definition of intimacy is to be vulnerable. Um, and to, and to your point, when they have had those conversations, it's just, it puts it on the table and it, and it's not, you know, it's not focusing on what are they thinking? You know what they're thinking. It's been it's been put out there now, but even for men that see that in themselves and feel comfortable disclosing that is, can be very hard. And we want to encourage that of course, that, that communication. All right. That's where we're going to end it today, guys. Thank you so much. Oh, sure. It's my pleasure. My pleasure. I definitely want to touch base with you because we want to do sleep. That's, oh, that's, have that's, a lot to say about sleep. I'm yeah, the poster the child for sleep disorder. So, <laughs> so for the rest of y'all, we're going to have him come back and, and do sleep and we'll we'll set that up. Not next month, but because next month we're going to be talking to Dr. Carolyn Parcells about medication. Like Great. what types of medication are out there? What what dosages that a lot of people see and why they're not necessarily, you know, as why, why they're often much higher than the FDA approved levels. Medications that a lot of people may not know about, like Quelbury or Journey. So we'll be talking about a lot of that as well. So look for that event. It'll be just like this one. Donate to, to join. Again, thank you. This is sure. I I learned a lot and it reinforced a lot. And I that's one of the big things I appreciate sometimes when I'm listening to experts talk about this kind of stuff is what am I doing right? Mm -hmm. Right. And, my, and now I'm thinking about my fitness pal. I, I'm that's one thing I'm doing right. Okay. All right. Let's just keep maintaining that one thing for right now yep. and start working through things with the nutritionists and stuff like that. Thank you, everyone. Y'all have a great night. Good night, appreciate everyone. It. Yep. Take care.